Good afternoon, everybody. You guys uh, heard about this new influenza virus in uh, China? It's an, it's, an, it's an avian virus that's been around for a long time, and they have a number of cases of human infections now, and uh, a couple of fatalities. So this is, this is what happens all the time. We'll probably talk about that in a subsequent lecture. So today we're going to talk about acute infections, and that is uh, one type of infection. You've heard about acute and persistent infections, and I want to talk more about acute ones, the ones that are over quickly, and give you some examples so that you can get a feel for how uh, these work. So you've seen this a couple of times now. These are the general patterns of infections. Uh, this is a timeline of virus production in blue. The blue lines are virus production in a host, and the red is disease. And so today we're going to talk about acute infections where the timeline is very short. You have virus production and disease all pretty much at the same time. And Dr. Silverstein has talked about infections that take longer, persistent infections that go on for long periods of time of all sorts. Um, so today, acute infection. So these are relatively brief. If you are healthy, your immune response kicks in, and you can eliminate the infection pretty quickly. And then you get immunity, you get memory, and you don't get that same virus again. And that's why vaccines work. Now, not everybody recovers from an acute infection. As you know, you hear in the news all the time, and this new influenza virus infecting humans in China has killed, I don't know, three or four or five people. Why is that? Sometimes you get overwhelmed. Sometimes your immune system isn't just right. Uh, or sometimes it's a brand new virus coming from an animal, a zoonotic infection. When you get infected with a virus from an animal, we'll have more to say about that later. Those can be overwhelming. Your immune system just isn't ready for it for whatever reasons. Time course of a typical uh, acute infection. Again, we're looking at virus growth in the red line with time. So here you're, you're infected with the virus. And remember, as soon as that virus comes in you, within hours, your innate defenses are kicking in. And they may or may not clear infection. But if they cannot, the virus keeps replicating. And remember, then you have a communication between the innate and the adaptive systems, you begin to make an adaptive response, which is shown here in blue, antibodies and T cells, of course. Uh, and then the virus is eventually cleared. Typically, the antibody response happens past the peak of virus replication. It's important for clearing it, uh, but it's not the only thing that clears. And then, of course, when you're recovered from this particular infection, you have what we call immune memory. Now. All virus infections, whether they're persistent or not, usually have an incubation, persistent or acute, usually have an incubation period. That's the period before you have symptoms. If you're going to have symptoms, uh, this is the time before that. In this time, you've been infected, of course. The virus is replicating. You are starting to respond, but you haven't got these systemic global effects yet. Remember, uh, interferon causes these generalized virus symptoms, fever, malaise, aches and pains, and so forth. The time before that happens is the incubation period. This can be very short. It can be a day or two. It can be hundreds of days. Whether it's years, I'm not sure. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, incubation periods can be short. And this usually indicates that wherever the virus comes in, it's replicating there, and that is where the disease symptoms arise. So for example, you inhale an influenza virus, relatively short incubation period, all of the disease is in the lungs, and so the incubation period is short. Whereas virus infections with a long incubation period typically, but not always, there are always example exceptions, typically means that the virus comes in one place, but then it goes somewhere other to cause disease. Measles virus, for example, you inhale it, but it has to go to your skin to, f to form the rash, so it takes a bit longer. It's not a day or two before you see rash. It takes more days because it takes time for the virus to replicate uh, and get there. All right, so here are some incubation periods of common infections from the shortest, like influenza and common colds. Respiratory infections, where, again, the symptoms of the respiratory, coughing and sneezing and so forth, those tend to be short because the virus is there. As soon as it gets in, it replicates and starts causing uh, the symptoms. 
And then as the viruses have to spread, uh, for example, polio, it takes longer. The virus has to get into the central nervous system. Uh, and you see it gets longer and longer here until uh, rabies is very long, 30 to 100 days, which is good because you have time to immunize someone uh, before they show the symptoms of rabies. And then HIV or AIDS is the longest here, uh, one to 10 years. Now, this is a little bit of a discussion point. I'm not sure that this is actually an incubation period. I think this is a persistent infection. Uh, but it's on this chart as an example of a long incubation period. This is from my textbook. I'm going to argue in the next edition that we take this off. Uh, we'll talk about more, more about this in the AIDS lecture. Now, of course, you can also have inapparent acute infections. We have mentioned this concept previously where you get infected, um, but you don't have symptoms. But the virus is replicating. It's just replicating below some threshold that's needed to make symptoms. So you can't tell that uh, you are ill in any sense. And of course, again, we know that there are inapparent infections because we often do serological surveys uh, looking for these. And you see antibodies in people who aren't sick or have never been sick or can't remember being sick. And this was very common in the days where polio was, was common in the US, for example. Cities would have an outbreak of polio. They do a sero survey and find that many more people were infected than had any, any symptoms whatsoever. These are typical of well-adapted pathogens. What I mean by that is this is a virus that came into the human population a long time ago, has evolved with us for many years, and has co-evolved peacefully, if you will. Uh, it, they come in, and they, they produce a lot of uh, inapparent infections. Now, acute, acute infections are most of the virus infections that public health officials worry about. These are the ones associated with big epidemics, polio in its heyday, uh, tens of thousands of people every year. Flu still infects millions uh, every year, and even measles. We shouldn't have any measles globally. We have a really good vaccine, but we have a lot of measles. So those kinds of infections are a problem. Uh, emerging infections, that is, zoonoses, viruses that go from animals to people like Ebola viruses, avian influenza viruses, these are also common health problems. They are acute infections as well. Uh, and they're difficult for, for a number of reasons. And here's the reason. Uh, by the time you make an immune response, the infection is over. It's, and the virus has gone on to someone else. So it's hard to diagnose these because by the time you have symptoms, it's often too late to do anything. Uh, and therefore, it's difficult to control the spread of these infections in large populations, especially in crowded situations, which we, as our society evolves, we have more and more of this. We have more collections of kids. We never used to have daycare centers years ago. Now we have tons of them. Uh, and that's really one good way to spread infections. Boot camps, college dorms, nursing homes, schools, and offices, all of these places are good because you come to work and you're infected in shedding virus but you don't have any symptoms, so you spread it to others. Most people, when they feel bad, they stay home. And you know, if, if you are doing things and contacting other people while you're sick, it's not really a good idea. You're, you're spreading the virus. You should really stay home. So that's why these acute infections explode. You, know, you have a few cases here and there, and all of a sudden, hundreds and thousands of them, because the virus has been shedding for a long time. And this is a problem for prescribing antivirals, these acute infections, because you have to get the infection very early on before you have symptoms. So Tamiflu is a common antiviral for influenza. If you don't take it within two days of feeling your first symptoms, it's useless. It's not going to do anything. Even as it is, it's not terribly useful for people like us. For people with health problems that would have serious life-threatening flu, it's important to treat them with an antiviral that will save their life. But for us, it's really not going to make much of a difference. So most people don't get to the physician in time. You need a prescription for Tamiflu. You have to go to the drugstore and fill it. By the time you do all that, your infection is uh, on the wane. So these acute infections are difficult. And influenza is one of the few for which we have rapid diagnostics. Now, most of the others, we don't. Many of the upper respiratory infections, the common cold infections, we don't have a rapid diagnostic, uh, which would enable us to treat very early. And as a consequence, there aren't too many antivirals. Uh, companies don't want to invest in making antivirals if there aren't tests to indicate when they should be used. 
Now, if we had a broad spectrum antiviral, that would be great because you have a respiratory syndrome, your physician would prescribe this broad spectrum and maybe someday we will have those. I've seen some reports in the literature of, for example, antivirals that get all enveloped viruses which would get most of the respiratory pathogens, but we're not there yet. So when you get infected with one of these viruses, of course, as I've already said, your innate response is, is important. And that is the main controller within the first few days because as you know, innate, uh, adaptive responses take much longer to develop. But you do need to make adaptive responsive to clear the, the infection. If you don't, many of these acute infections will go on and on. Um, and in people without immune systems, these acute infections become persistent or lethal. They're not cleared at all. They can infect them for ages. For example, people without B cells who get the polio vaccine, the infectious polio vaccine, they can shed virus for 20 years or more. And in other cases, uh, it can cause death. So your immune system is really important in protection. So these are the viruses I want to tell you about today. We're going to go through them and just talk about how they infect and cause disease. And I pick them because they represent viruses that infect you in different ways. Influenza and measles, uh, both respiratory acquired, but flu causes its disease in the lung whereas measles spread. Uh, polio, rhoda, and norovirus are enteric viruses. They infect your gut tract and do different things. And then West Nile virus, a uh, mosquito-borne infection, which the others are not. So we'll talk about all of those. And of course, now you know what all these icons mean you understand the structure of these viruses as well. So let's start with influenza viruses. Uh, we are in April now, pretty much over the influenza season, uh, which is typically done by May, and there's very little activity at this time of year. There are three types of influenza. They're called A, B, and C. Uh, A and B cause the flu that you would get in a flu season. C is mostly uh, inapparent infections, interestingly. Uh, only the A types cause what, cause what we call pandemics, that is global epidemics where a single strain is spreading all around the world and causing extensive infection. And we'll have more to say about that in our vaccine lecture. And these viruses, the hallmark of them is antigenic variation. They can escape your immune response. So even though you make a nice uh, memory response to influenza, it may be useless in a year or two as the virus is changing to escape it. These viruses enter the respiratory tract. Uh, they begin to replicate in the epithelium lining the respiratory tract. We've talked about this before in pathogenesis. And influenza virus infection is typically focused in the trachea. So it is not strictly an upper tract pathogen, although in some cases, influenza infections are restricted to the upper tract. But the, the cardinal feature is replication in the trachea, so you really have symptoms lower in your chest than if you had a common cold, for example. And in some cases, the virus goes down even further into the, to the uh, bronchi, the bronchioles, and of course, if it gets down into the alveoli, it causes pneumonia, which can be fatal. So influenza, you can see here, uh, is shown infecting the entire tract from the top uh, all the way to the bottom. And the virus remains there. It, um, if it does get into the blood or if you swallow some of the virus, it's rapidly inactivated and does not replicate in any other tissues because of the tropism is limited uh, by the protease that cleaves uh, the virus hemagglutinin. The transmission occurs in three general ways by droplets that you make, talking, sneezing, or coughing. And they're full of virus, of course, because it's being shed from your mucosal epithelium. Uh, it's also spread by contact, direct contact between infected and uninfected individual or contact with contaminated surfaces. Um, it's, a study was done in Switzerland a number of years ago where they put influenza virus on Swiss banknotes. What better country to do this study, right? Plenty of banknotes in Switzerland. And they figured out how long the virus would last on the banknote. So they pipetted some virus on and then they just let it sit for a while. It turns out if you mix the virus with some mucus, it stays for two weeks on the banknote. Okay, better, another reason not to use cash anymore. So this virus is, it won't last forever, but it will last long enough to infect someone else. So when you get some influenza virus in your respiratory tract, 
There's an incubation period, one to five days, and it depends on how much virus you get, what, how good your immune system is, and so forth. And then all of a sudden you get sick, and you can usually pinpoint the day, the hour of the day when you got influenza, because bam, it's on you right away. It's not like a common cold where it's kind of insidious, you get a little sore throat, a scratchiness, uh, sniffles, flu is bam, it's right on you like that. Headache, chills, dry cough, it's associated with high fevers, very high fevers, more than many other infections, uh, muscle aches, laziness, and so forth. You get a fever peaking within a short time, it begins to decline, uh, and, but then you have other symptoms as you will see. Now this is a typical course of influenza in an, in an adult, a healthy adult, but in children and very old people this can be very different, typically fatal in the very young, uh, in the very old. So your fever declines and you begin to cough more and more. Uh, you have a productive cough later on where you're not just having a dry cough, but you're coughing up mucus, and, and this is part of the lungs defense trying to get rid of the infection. Uh, the virus replicates throughout the tract, as I said, and um, you feel lousy for a long time. You can cough for two weeks, and a common cold won't have you do that. You can really tell the difference between this and a common cold. And the, the virus really wrecks your, your, your trachea and bronchi if it gets down that far. Part of it is because all the CD8 cells come in and they're killing virus-infected cells, and that does a lot of damage. So it takes you a long time to recover. You may have a persistent cough. You may have trouble breathing, depending on your breathing status to begin with. So how do you diagnose it? You feel this illness, what do you do? Well, you can go to a healthcare provider and they will say, well, you have, it's winter time and it's flu season. You have an influenza-like illness, which is fever, high fever, 100 degrees at least, cough or sore throat. And that's enough, that's influenza-like illness. They'll say, yeah, oh, you probably have flu, it's that time of year, and um, here's some Tamiflu, if you've gone soon enough. Of course, if you've had it for five days, they're not gonna give you anything, just go home and not infect anyone else. There are some rapid lab tests, so you can go into a physician's office and they'll pull out a dipstick and take a little of nasal secretions and put it on this, and it's some kind of an ELISA uh, looking for a viral antigen. But these are, these are terrible. They're about 50% accurate. And so if it's negative, it doesn't mean you don't have flu influenza. There are other ways to diagnose infection. You can do PCR, you can culture the virus, you can do serology, but these take a lot longer. All right, PCR will take much longer than these quick tests. And if you're really racing to get the Tamiflu in, what most physicians will do is see influenza-like illness. It's winter time. Here's a prescription for Tamiflu and that's the end of it. So someday we have to get better at this, but this is the way it's done now. Uh, a couple of graphs just to show you the course of infection. On the upper left, this was actually a, um, an experimental infection. So with influenza, you can infect people. There's some strains that are pretty mild. There's a place over in the UK which is dedicated just to doing this. If you want to do a clinical study, they'll recruit patients and house them in this hospital and take care of them, inoculate them, watch them, make sure they're okay. So you can do studies where you feed, you, you put influenza virus in people's nose and then uh, collect virus. So here, uh, these, these patients were inoculated with virus and then uh, they look at viral shedding in uh, nasal secretions and then symptoms. They ask the patient how they feel and they have a, a chart with certain things on it and uh, they score it and they give it a score and you can see uh, within uh, a day or so, you start to have virus in nasal secretions, uh, and it peaks at three days. And, you know, the symptom peak is, is really just a day behind. So there's not a big lag, but uh, there, there may be a time early on when you are shedding virus and you, and you don't have a lot of symptoms. And then eventually here, by nine days, you see the symptoms have abated and there's no more virus. Uh, on the bottom is another kind, a similar study, but looking at uh, s some additional things here days after virus administration. And we're looking at virus in, in nasal, nasal wash. And you can see here it's peaking at uh, three days, kind of similar to this study. This is a different one. Uh, and then it's down by six days. Um, we have here interferon. So you can see interferon goes up very quickly. This is interferon in nasal secretions. And this is what you would expect. As soon as your cells are infected, they're going to make interferon to try and clear the infection. And then if that doesn't work, you know, you have to call in an adaptive response. And then here are the antibodies against the virus. Um, these are um, antibodies against um, either in the nasal wash or the serum. 
uh, against the viral proteins on the surface. So you can see they come up way after the virus is cleared here. So they're not playing a, a terribly important role in resolving the infection. You need to have them, but it's mostly CTLs that's taking care of, of this infection. Now influenza is seasonal. <clears throat> and in the U.S., in temperate climates such as this, it occurs in the winter with an incredibly regular pattern. So these are just outbreaks in the US and actually all over the world the WHO coordinates collection of specimens from people who think they have flu and they look for virus in these by culture or PCR so they're very accurate and they want to know where this virus is and when and what kind of virus is it so here are the results for four different uh, influenza seasons uh, in the US this is CDC information they're part of the global network and then they, they not only look at the total number of isolates uh, but which are these lines but um, also they type the viruses uh, if they're type A and if so whether the specific antigenic composition H3N2 or H1N1 or if they're influenza B virus so you can see here um, in, this, in these seasons there's a lot of unsubtyped uh, strains but here for example the H3N2 uh, isolates predominated uh, whereas the next season it was mostly H1N1 so you see this is the number of isolates, 3,000 or so, uh, 4,000 here, the number was, was a bit higher. But again, this is not total flu in the country. This is just a sampling of uh, various centers around the nation where people will go into a physician's office or a hospital with suspected influenza, and they take a sample and process it. So this is very useful information. Uh, this is this year's season, um, 2000 and 12, 13, so it began at the end of 2012. Here's week 42, 44, week 46. You can see uh, that's towards the end of the year, November, December, an increase and then a peak here um, in the first weeks of uh, 2013. And now we're here, uh, this is probably last week, this last bar here, you can see there's not much flu anymore. It was in all the states in the US, but there's not much more less. Uh, most of it this year was the H3N2 strain. It's very interesting. And back in 2009, we had a, pan a new pandemic strain emerge, and we'll talk about that in another lecture. And that spread pretty quickly for the next couple of seasons, but now it's almost gone. It's this is golden bars here. You can see very few isolates of that. Uh, there's a lot of type B influenza as well. Yes? Right. So the question is, when they make the flu shot, do they predict the strains? Absolutely. So they have to make a new vaccine every year. So in January, they collect, they've been collecting these kinds of strains from all over the world. And in January, uh, they're trying to predict the strains for us for the next season. So they take the data from the southern hemisphere, and they see what's circulating, and they try and make a guess. So was it accurate for this year? Or? This year was a perfect match. Yes. This was a perfect match this year. All the strains were, were really well matched against the vaccine, um, but there's still flu, and that's partly because you know, only, I think, 40% of the US population takes the flu vaccine, so you have influenza. And then the vaccine itself, the inactivated vaccine, uh, which is injected, is only about 60% ef uh, efficient at preventing influenza. We'll talk about those later on. So we, we can do a lot more with influenza. So even in the best match between the vaccine and the strain, uh, you don't do all that well. A couple of other ways to measure influenza in the country. These are, again, from the CDC side. It's really a great wealth of information. In particular, this one infection, they really do a lot of work on. On the upper left, this is pneumonia and influenza mortality. So these are people who have died. Now, if you're middle-aged and older and you die of a respiratory illness, pneumonia, they don't put influenza on your death certificate most of the time. Most of the time they'll put pneumonia. And so the CDC has developed an algorithm to figure out what fraction of pneumonia deaths are influenza. So that's what this is. So you can see there's a, there's a cycling with the flu season every year. There's a peak and a trough when the virus goes away. And in some seasons, there's a lot of flu and, and pneumonia mortality like there. And this is this year. We had quite a peak of, of mortality. So this season was more severe in terms of uh, mortality. Now, on the lower right are 
influenza-associated pediatric deaths. Now, in the pediatric population, this is a reportable disease. If a child dies of influenza, you have to report that to the CDC, and that's why they have very good statistics. So you can see this is just the number of deaths in each of the flu seasons. 282 here, 122, 34, last season pretty mild, and this year, um, 110. Now this is under-reporting. This is not every child, of course, who has died of flu, but it gives you a sampling uh, for what's going on throughout the country. In the U.S., uh, we have about 35 to 50 million cases of influenza a year. This is an estimate, obviously, because we can't diagnose every one of them. Uh, and anywhere between 3,000 and 49,000 deaths. It depends on the season, um, and that's the range for the past 31 years. So this is a serious disease. Not, you don't want to have any of these people dying if you have a vaccine that prevents it. And as I said, we don't yet have that kind of vaccine, and that's why there's a lot of money poured into uh, working on this virus. So this is a respiratory infection. You get flu. If you're healthy, you recover, but there can be complications. You can get viral pneumonia, which is when the virus goes way down into the alveoli and wrecks your lung function. You get fluid accumulating. You can die of this. You can get secondary bacterial pneumonia, where after you're beginning to recover from virus infection, the bacteria move into your lung and, and cause pneumonia. Uh, myositis, there can be heart involvement, which may be a consequence of uh, of the lung dysfunction, and then a uh, syndrome called Rye's syndrome, where you have um, a variety of organs having pathologies, not from direct virus replication, but possibly from cytokines, but we're not really sure about that. Uh, what do you do if you have flu? Well, you can go to the drugstore and buy something that you think might make you feel better, and if it helps psychologically, that's good. But the antiviral drugs are all prescription. Uh, we have three of them. Tamiflu and Relenza hit the neuraminidase protein on the surface of the virus. That's an enzyme. We'll talk about that later. And uh, flumidine hits the, the ion channel in the virion. Remember I told you that in the virion there's an ion channel that's important for entry, and this drug blocks that as well. And of course then there's the vaccine, and everyone should get the vaccine so you don't have to take these uh, antiviral drugs. So we'll have more to say about flu uh, in a couple of other lectures as well. The next virus I want to talk about is the one I own that's polio virus. No, I don't really own it, but I work on it, and so I'm very fond of it. Uh, this is not an envelope virus like influenza. This is icosahedral pure protein, about 30 nanometers in diameter with an RNA genome uh, inside of it. At one time, there was a lot of polio in this country. Today, there's none as far as we know. I'll bet there's virus here, but there's no uh, paralytic disease. The way you acquire polio is you ingest it. You swallow fecally contaminated material. It goes through your stomach, it goes through your small intestine, and begins to replicate uh, in the intestinal mucosa. It gets past the basal, basal lateral membrane, gets into the blood, and establishes a viremia. It then goes to some other tissues and replicates, so it amplifies the viremia. Uh, and in most infections, that's the end of the, uh, the polio infection. You get a little flu-like syndrome, right, fever. Uh, myalgia and so forth, uh, and then the virus is, is cleared. Uh, you shed virus in the intestine and that's how you infect other people. In about 1% of cases, 1 out of 100 infections, the virus gets into the central nervous system. I think this is an accident because if you think about it, this is not a good way to spread from host to host to get into the CNS, right? Unless you're an animal. I mean, there's certainly examples of animals that have CNS infections who are eaten by other animals and transmit the infection that way, but we don't do that. So the getting into the CNS is an accident, and we think the virus gets in there by, by axonal routes. It probably gets into the muscle through the viremia, gets in the end of, of, of nerves, and then makes its way uh, into the spinal cord. So I, many years ago in my lab, when I first started my lab at Columbia, I wanted to study this disease. Uh, but unfortunately, the only natural host is humans, and you can experimentally infect monkeys, but I wasn't really interested in doing that, so we made a mouse that could be infected with the virus. So mice normally are not susceptible to infection, but they are permissive, remember? So if you put the RNA into mouse cells, the virus will replicate, but there's no receptor on the surface. So one of my students, Kathy Mendelson, cloned the human gene encoding the receptor for the virus, that's shown on the left here, and then a second student, Rebel Wren, 
made a transgenic mouse expressing that human gene. And that's all you need to get these mouse now infected with polio. They now become susceptible and permissive. See, now, that, now you know why I wanted you to learn those terms, just so you could understand uh, this experiment. So this mouse has been inoculated with polio, and you see it has hind limb paralysis. So what happens is the virus makes its way into the CNS. It multiplies in neurons in the spinal cord and in the brain. And if it destroys enough of those cells, then you have paralysis. So here is a section of spinal cord from the mouse in the previous slide. So that animal was paralyzed. We take a section of spinal cord, and it's hybridized with an RNA probe looking for viral RNA. So all these green dots are where the virus is replicating. And these are all neurons. You can tell by their size and their shape. None of the other cells get infected, just neurons. And you destroy enough neurons, then you get paralysis. Also, you can see a lot of dark staining cells coming in here. These are probably immune cells of some sort, lymphocytes or macrophages, that are probably coming in and trying to clear uh, the infection. So that was a, that's been a nice model for studying uh, the pathogenesis of polio. Now, here is a wonderful graph from a 1950s textbook of medicine. If you pick up a textbook of medicine today, you will not find anything on polio in it because there is no more polio in the U.S., so uh, we don't teach medical students about it, although I do in my lectures. But, um, and I show them this slide. This is a wonderful slide showing a time course of polio infection. So what we're looking at here is days after exposure, and then we, we have uh, on the top, some of the days are, are enumerated. We have the temperature, the person's temperature. So this is a human. Uh, and then we have virus in these next three panels, virus in the alimentary tract, in the throat, uh, virus in the blood, serum antibody, and virus in the CNS. So let's take this through. You expose uh, the person to polio. Uh, this is one virus you cannot infect people with. Okay, so you have to make observations on, on people who are already infected. You have an incubation period of about six days. You have a rise in temperature. Uh, during this period, you have virus replicating in your intestines because you see it's in the feces. And you also have virus in the blood. So the virus is replicated in the intestine. It's made its way to the blood. You've got fever because you're making cytokines and you're shedding it in the feces. 99% of the infections end there. So you have headaches, sore throat, maybe nausea, you know, the standard flu-like symptoms. You get better and that's it. Now, you're, if you're walking around uh, in a city in the 30s or 40s or 50s, you're, sh you're spreading polio. And so this is the main way the virus was spread to others. In 1% of infections, the virus remains in the individual and it enters the CNS. You see by day 11, 12, it begins to rise in the central nervous system. You then have the paralysis that's accompanied with this, stiffness, pain, and muscle pain, and paralysis. And uh, you may or may not recover. There's a certain fatality associated with, with polio depending uh, on where the virus is. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, um, I, this is just the impression that I have about it, but for some reason I got the impression that polio used to be like, there used to be a huge hype about polio when it was um, big during those times. Yeah. Paralysis only occurred in 1% of the population. Why are there such a huge hype? Okay, so the question is why was there such hype around polio if only 1% of infections cause paralysis because if you have <coughs> if you have millions of infections you got a lot of people with paralysis so there were 30 to 40 to 50,000 paralytic cases a year in the US but even bigger issue is those were kids for the most part and so they ended up being paralyzed so there was a lot of impetus to uh, take to do something with that the other thing is that President Roosevelt had polio and he didn't really like that and he was he was frustrated so he, he raised money to make a foundation, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, and, he, and that funded the vaccines that were eventually made. Okay, so you see also, the other thing I wanna point out here is that you shed virus a long time in the feces, 30 days here. So typically 30 to 60 days, even after you've recovered. So, you know, at one point in the US, uh, in New York City in particular, there were polio police. They would look to see what kids were getting symptoms of polio, and they would immediately take those kids and quarantine them. And this was so wrong, because those are not the people you have to quarantine. It's all, everybody else walking around uh, in the city that were infected, shedding virus, but had no symptoms. 
So we're the only known reservoir. As I said, the, the virus is spread by fecal oral contamination. This is a virus that peaks, or a disease that peaks in the summertime, as opposed to flu, which peaks in the winter. Uh, there is a complication called post-polio syndrome. So many people who had paralyzed limbs with therapy could recover their function and walk again. And a number of those, 30 to 40 years later, end up getting paralyzed again in, the, in their back in a wheelchair. And this is called post-polio syndrome. There's no virus involved there. Uh, it's anywhere from a quarter to 40% of the people who, who had polio originally. And what we think is happening is as you age, you lose neurons. And if you had a polio, you've already lost a lot. You don't have a backup anymore, so you, you develop paralysis. There are still people with post-polio in the U.S. now because they're, they're remaining from the 50s and 60s when we still had uh, quite a bit of polio in the U.S. So we have two vaccines that are used uh, against polio. The first uh, introduced in 1955. You can see the cases per year peaking here, 20,000 or so in the U.S. Uh, and these two vaccines have eliminated polio from the U.S. There's no more polio in the U.S. and we're working on eradicating it globally. And I'll have more to say about this uh, eradication in our vaccine lecture. All right, so that is an enteric virus. Now we're going to jump back to the respiratory tract. Yes? Where's the highest incidence rate? The, right now? Polio, yeah. Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Those are the three highest rates of polio. Last year, there were only 222 cases, though, so that's pretty good. Uh, and maybe in the next 10 years, it'll be gone. All right, measles is the next pathogen, acute viral pathogen. It's a paramyxovirus. This is one of the most contagious human viruses. Uh, you know, a person infected with measles can infect 15 to 20 other people. Um, that's the reproductive index. If a virus is going to be successful, it has to be over one. You can't just infect one other person. So most viruses do two or three. Measles is, is incredibly contagious. Uh, if I had measles and I were talking in this room and you were all seronegative, you would probably all be infected just by my talking and shedding virus. You need a large population to sustain the virus, though. You need 300 to 500,000 people, so small towns of less than this will not have uh, measles outbreaks. So that's what the virus looks like. We've seen this virus before. It's enveloped with glycoproteins in the envelope, and it's got an RNA uh, of negative strandedness inside, which is complex with proteins, of course, because being a negative strand, can't do anything when it gets in the cell. Uh, and that RNA has helical uh, symmetry. There is one serotype of measles virus. I didn't tell you this, but there are three serotypes of polio. So when you make a polio vaccine, you have to cover all three. Uh, serotypes, but measles, there's just one, and this is a virus transmitted by inhaling respiratory secretions. Uh, this is a little different from flu because you are shedding a lot of virus before you get a rash, so you can be quite healthy feeling and walking around exhaling virus and infecting others before you get a rash. And of course, when we had a lot of measles in this country when I was a kid, um, I don't think I had a measles vaccine. Did you, Dr. Silverstein? No. Do you remember measles? Yes. So you have a rash and then you have to stay home. And nowadays, interestingly, we have a great vaccine, by the way, and I have people in my neighborhood whose kids get measles and they have to stay home, covered with a terrible rash. And why did they get measles? They, vaccinated. they were not vaccinated. Very few in, in apparent infections. So eventually you're gonna show rash and you stay home from school. So you inhale the virus, Infects, well, it actually doesn't infect your respiratory epithelium. This is really interesting. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it does get into your blood, and it spreads to other organs. It likes to replicate in lymphocytes, white blood cells. So it goes to your spleen and your lymph nodes and replicates in those. And then it gets to your skin where it causes a rash. Now, I'm, I'm talking about measles here as an acute infection, but you heard from Dr. Silverstein the other day that there are some rare late complications like subacute sclerosing panencephalitis and this is really a persistent or latent infection so this is a virus that can do both let me tell you the lung story this is very interesting so you inhale this virus laden mist the virus gets into your lung i'm sorry this is so small but uh, i'm going to explain it to you so here you've inhaled virus and these are virus particles on your respiratory epithelium 
the virus doesn't actually replicate initially in those cells. It's not till very late in infection does it replicate in them. So what we think happens is there are immune cells like macrophages patrolling the mucosal surface. They get infected with the virus and then they bring it across the basement membrane and it gets into your circulation that way. Okay. So then you have a viremia. Uh, the virus, as I said, likes to go to spleen and lymph nodes and other organs where there are lots of immune cells, uh, lymphocytes. Uh, then it gets to your skin, of course, and it makes the rash. Now, how does it get out to spread to other people if it's not replicating in the epithelium? Well, it turns out that late in infection, after a certain uh, incubation period, you begin to shed viruses from the epithelium, and that's how you spread it to someone else. So it's quite clear that um, uh, the, the epithelium eventually gets infected, but it gets infected from beneath. It doesn't get infected from above, because remember, the virus is brought in by a macrophage. There is a receptor on the underside of these epithelial cells. It's called nectin-4. Um, you don't need to know that. It's just, it's not on the top. It's on the bottom, and the virus uh, eventually makes its way back to your basal lateral epithelium, infects there, replicates in these cells, and then is shed. This is, right? That's brilliant. It gets in without infecting the cells, but eventually it has to infect them uh, in order to get out. So this is a cool story that was just figured out uh, in the last year or so. I have to replace my batteries here. So there are actually a couple of different receptors uh, that this virus uses to do all of this, not just one. All right, so you get a rash from measles, and this is the typical rash here, all over the body, the trunk and the arms and the face. And you're not happy when you have this rash. It can be painful. You have high fever. You have a cough because this virus is replicating in your respiratory tract. Conjunctivitis, uh, eye infection. Coplic spots are white spots in the mouth. You probably can't see these very well. But you know, if you s suspect a kid to have measles, you look in the mouth, you see these white spots. That pretty much uh, nails the diagnosis. Complications of measles, uh, you can get encephalitis at, at a rather high frequency. So the virus gets into your brain and uh, can cause problems there. You can get pneumonia, ear infections. It has a 1 to 2 percent fatality, uh, sorry, 1 to 2 per thousand in the U.S., in Europe. But when you go to countries where they don't have good nutrition, it's 28 percent fatal. And that's because uh, nutrition is important to maintain your immune response. The late sequelae we talked about, Dr. Silverstein talked about SSPE, and maybe the main problem with measles is that it's an immunosuppressing virus. It infects your immune system cells and destroys their function, so then you're susceptible to other infections, not only viral, but bacterial infections as well. And that's the main reason why people die in third world countries where there are lots of other uh, microbes circulating. Now, at one time in the U.S., we had three to four million cases of measles per year, uh, four to five hundred deaths, a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of chronic, everlasting issues from having virus replicating in your brain. We introduced the vaccine in the 60s. We stopped uh, endemic trans transmission by the year 2000. Today, you get the virus vaccine as part of a trivalent preparation, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, MMR. Uh, this was unfortunately the target of a British gastroenterologist, Andrew Wakefield, who in 1998 published a paper saying that measles virus vaccine probably caused autism. And this study was completely flawed and has since been withdrawn and discredited, but his effect was quite wide. Many parents decided not to immunize their children. He's actually now, he, he's, been, he's been disbarred from practicing in the UK, uh, but he found a home in Texas where they welcomed him with open arms and he's still promoting the idea that some kind of vaccine causes autism, which is really, really poor because this is, this is not true. Um, there was a lot of vaccine denial in the UK and Ireland. There have been large outbreaks of measles there and then they spread to the US where in states like California and Oregon, people choose not to, to immunize their kids. This happens to occur in communities, like a community will say, well, we're not going to use MMR vaccine because it causes autism. Um, 
and then you have all these susceptibles and then you have an outbreak of measles. So in the US we have a lot of measles but it's mostly imported. Uh, the vaccine was licensed in the 60s. You see here, here were the cases of measles in the US. And you see um, it got rid of measles pretty much. Um, and deaths along with it. There were many measles deaths and those are all gone as well. Globally we still have a measles issue. These are colored according to the number of cases in this time period. So have some countries have no measles, um, but others have between 1, 9, 10, and 100. The U.S. has between 100 and 1,000 cases every, well, at least in this time period. And again, these are mostly imported that get amplified. We have a big problem in China, uh, parts of Europe as well, and Africa. And many of these areas, like Russia, uh, they can't get the vaccine to everyone, which is why we have a lot of measles. This is a preventable disease. The vaccine is really good, and it doesn't do anything bad to you. So I don't, you know, this is really unexcusable to have a vaccine, to have a disease uh, that could be preventable and having it still occur. Okay, let's go back to the gut tract. And I think this is a very neat statistic, right? Every 24 hours, 200 million people have gastroenteritis, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And the amount of water they pass passes over Victoria Falls every minute, 65 million liters per minute. So just think of those 200 million people. Diarrhea, 65 million liters a minute. <laughs> that is a lot of water. And if you're in a place that doesn't put the water back, then you can die of dehydration. So let's talk about a virus that does that rotavirus, single most important cause of diarrheal inf illness in infants. About 30 to 50 percent of all kids will get uh, rotavirus infection and have gastroenteritis. These were discovered very recently, and now there are seven sero groups. There are also rotaviruses that f infect probably all the animals that are out there besides human. Uh, these are viruses with a segmented, double stranded. Uh, RNA genome, which is important because you'll see that's how the vaccine is made. Uh, this infects eventually uh, every kid in the world, peaks in the winter. Uh, a lot of physician visits are a consequence of this. Before the vaccine in the, in the U.S., 2 million hospitalizations, I'm sorry, this is global, 2 million hospitalizations, 800,000 deaths. Uh, in the U.S., all the children were infected by five years of age. Uh, and one in 72 were hospitalized. And in, in developing world, because they cannot give these kids intravenous fluids, they would die. And there was a 5% of all mortality in kids less than five years old. So this was really an important pathogen for very young children. As you get infected older, it's less of an issue because you have some immunity, which modulates the gastroenteritis. But as a young child, it's, it can be fatal because of the dehydration. Uh, these are the global, this is the global distribution of deaths currently. Each dot is 500 deaths. So you can see in the U.S. and Canada, we don't, we don't have deaths because we vaccinate. Or if a child gets rotavirus gastroenteritis, you bring it to a the child to a hospital and they get intravenous fluids. And that's all you need to prevent death. But in many countries where health care isn't very good, you see uh, there are lots of deaths. India in particular has a high burden of rotavirus death. That's what the virus looks like. It is a double shelled icosahedron virion with uh, glycoproteins in the outer portion. The uh, genome is double stranded RNA in, in 10 segments. Uh, and when they were first discovered, this was the EM. Actually, people would just take samples from the intestine from people with rotavirus, with gastroenteritis, and they saw these virions in the electron microscope. And they looked like wheels, and that's what rota means, a uh, wheel. And this is a, a nicer colorized view on the right. These viruses are transmitted by fecal oral contamination. You don't need very many particles to get infected. 10 to 100 will do. And as I said, very young infants are at risk of dehydration and dying. And older people, not, a, not as much as a problem. You, you excrete a lot of virus in the feces, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th per mil. So the symptoms are fever, vomiting, diarrhea, Diarrhea, 65 million liters per minute. Well, not all of it is rotaviral, but a lot of it is. And abdominal pain. How do you spread it? Contaminated hands, <coughs> contaminated foods, environmental surfaces. The, vi the virus is quite stable. More than influenza virus, probably weeks to months 
the disease is usually self-limiting as long as you have uh, water supplied. Um, there are many people who are asymptomatically infected. They don't have symptoms. And if these people are preparing food in a restaurant, you're going to have a lot of other people infected. So they're working there. They're not sick, so why should they not be working? Short incubation period, vomiting, four to eight days of diarrhea. Sound like fun? It's a great disease. And then, as I said, um, but that's a good way to spread it, right? Four to eight, lead, four to eight days of diarrhea. Um, and then um, you get better unless you don't have electrolytes. You ingest the virus, it replicates in the mucosa of your intestine. And here is a section of, of the intestine of an animal that had been infected with a rotavirus and it's stained for viral antigen. You can see the virus replicating in the cells of the villi. And this infection causes an imbalance in chloride and other uh, ions in the intestine and that's partly why we have diarrhea. We don't really understand the basis for the diarrhea but it has to do with the effects of the virus uh, on the cells. And of course you shed the virus and that's the way you spread it to others. You know, if you, go, if you go to the bathroom you don't wash your hands well you will come out and contaminate surfaces and all sorts of other things. Now we have two, two different vaccines for rotaviruses and these are typically given to young children in the US so that they're immunized and they don't get this life-threatening diarrhea. Uh, they're called Rotorix, which is an attenuated human isolate. So they take a human strain and they passage it in cell culture until it no longer causes uh, diarrhea. Uh, and that's here, the Rotorix, you drink it, it replicates in your gut, it gives you immunity, but it doesn't cause disease. And then there's another company that makes one called Rotatech. This is a reassortant between human and bovine strains. Now, if you take bovine or other, any other animal rotaviruses and infect people with them, they don't get sick. The viruses replicate. You get an immune response, but you don't get sick. So what they do here is they co-infect cells with human rotaviruses and bovine. And then in the yield of the co-infection, they select for viruses that have the surface glycoproteins of the human strain and everything else from the bovine strain. So that means when you get infected with these, these are also taken uh, orally, replicates in your intestine, no disease because it's mostly bovine genes, but you make antibodies against the human glycoproteins in the particle. And so you're protected against uh, human infections, infection with human strains. Uh, about uh, two years ago, some, someone had the idea to buy a whole bunch of uh, virus vaccines and just deep sequence them. So now I, I told you at the beginning of this course we can sequence just about anything really quickly and really sensitively. So uh, they, they bought a bunch of vaccines and sequenced them and they found viruses contaminating them. And in particular these two were contaminated by a porcine circovirus. These are these uh, small DNA containing viruses, icosahedral, with single stranded DNA genomes. So for a while these vaccines were suspended because no one knew what would happen. And eventually they had data that this didn't do anything to people, so um, uh, they, they are now selling them again. But apparently this came from, so the porcine circovirus came from the trypsin used to split the cells that were used to make the vaccine. So when you, when you split cells, you use trypsin, and that trypsin comes from porcine uh, pancreas, and it's got virus in it. And there's nothing you can do about it. All our blood has porcine circovirus. When you eat pork, uh, you, you have porcine circovirus in your intestine, but it doesn't seem to do anything uh, to us. Okay, the other uh, virus that causes gastroenteritis in a big time way is, are the noroviruses, which are part of the Calissi virus family. These are plus stranded RNA viruses. Uh, they are icosahedral, just similar to polio, but, uh, and they even have a VPG at the, on the viral RNA. They cause half of all foodborne outbreaks of gastroenteritis. 23 million cases per year in the U.S. So if you read about outbreaks of gastroenteritis, which are apparently foodborne, if you read about an athlete that gets stomach flu, they call it, it drives me crazy because there's no flu virus, but it's just the symptoms, of course. You read about an athlete that can't do something because they have, this, it's usually this, they've eaten contaminated food and they get sick uh, for a couple of days. These cannot be grown in cell culture, so really hard uh, to study them. So here's the impact of noroviruses, known causes of foodborne illness in the U.S., noroviruses and bacteria and everything else. Norovirus is a two-bucket illness. 
you have vomiting and you have diarrhea. It's very much like rotavirus. Someone, a microbiologist told me that a while ago. I really like it. Two bucket illness. Fecal oral spread, uh, the virus of course goes through your stomach, goes into your intestine and replicates somewhere in there. We don't really know where because we can't study it. This is one of these viruses where you can do studies. You can infect volunteers, but since you can't grow the virus in culture, you feed them in fecal filtrate. Yes? How many liters does this one produce? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. How many liters? Did I tell you the story about medical students being used for this, uh, for trials? No? All right, let me take your question first. I was just going to ask why it can't be grown in the culture. Nobody knows. It, we don't know if it's a receptor issue, susceptibility, permissivity. People have tried all different kinds of cells. They have the whole genome clone. Can't do it. You can grow animal neuroviruses, mouse neurovirus you can grow, but not the human one. Um, so th what they typically do is they take fecal filtrates and they use them to feed volunteers. And you can, you know, give people one or ten or a hundred particles and see what the infectivity is and what happens. And they typically will en engage medical students to do this. On a Friday they feed them this stuff and they get sick over the weekend and then Monday they go back to school because they're well. It's only a couple day illness. And then they're, they're there at a hospital and they can measure all the parameters they need to. So I know a lot of people who have participated in these kinds of studies. You know, you get paid 400 bucks and you're sick for a weekend. <laughs> Affects all ages of people year round, although there are peaks in cold weather. And the outbreaks tend to occur in closed environments. Cruise ships is a big one, but also hospitals, nursing homes, and sporting events, camping trips, wherever people are close together and they're not very clean and someone is shedding neurovirus, this will do it. Uh, short incubation period, vomiting, diarrhea, 30% asymptomatic infection, so that's a problem. You have a food handler shedding neurovirus. This is what happens on a cruise ship. You know, these people are working in the kitchen. They're contaminating all the food, all the surfaces, and the whole ship gets infected and they have to go home and clean it out. Um, 28 to 60 hours duration. If you're immunocompromised, it can last longer. But nobody really dies of this. This mostly happens uh, in places where we can, we can give people fluids. Um, virus shedding can, peak for, uh, can persist for a long time. The transmission is fecal oral, but also aerosols. When you vomit, you make an aerosol, and that aerosol people can inhale and swallow, and that will infect them. Uh, firm surfaces, fomites, food, water, environmental surfaces, um, et cetera, all during preparation by handlers. Now, we don't have a vaccine for this because we can't grow the virus, but even when you get an infection, you get reinfected within a year, so that infection doesn't protect you, and we really don't understand uh, why that is so. And I'm not going to tell you much about this. You can read this, but here's a real-life airplane, an entire flight infected so somebody threw up in the bag and then the, the, someone came to clean it up and then they infected everyone. And then some of the flight attendants went on another flight and they were infected so they infected the other flight as well. So this happens all the time. Not only did the crew that cleaned up the mess get sick, but ev on every successive flight at least one or more crew members got sick. Neurovirus in the news. So these are just examples of cruises where there have been outbreaks of neurovirus infection. And we know this because these are monitored. It's not that CDC is interested in cruises, but this happens to be one of the big places where there are outbreaks, closed environment, food handlers, asymptomatic, shedding virus, contaminating the food. Many people uh, get sick. I would never go on a cruise, I'm telling you. <laughs> I think you have to be crazy to go on one of these things because you're just taking a risk. There's going to be an outbreak. <laughs> Why are they associated with cruise ships? Well, they tr we track illness, as I say, so they're reported quickly. The close living quarters increases contact. And then, um, you know, new passengers get on a ship, and the other ones get off, and there's good opportunity for spread. So the CDC says this is the way to protect yourself. You know, cook your food, clean the surfaces. When you're sick, don't prepare food for others. But what if you're not sick and you're shedding virus? You don't know it. That's the real problem. Biggest thing, don't eat the mints in the restaurant in the, in the bowl by the door. Don't touch them, even if there's a wrapper on them. Because someone has just come out of the bathroom and they didn't wash their hands and they pick up a peanut or a mint. People have done studies on these things. They are totally contaminated. Okay, don't resist the temptation because that's another way you can get uh, neurovirus transmission. 
Okay, the last virus is West Nile virus. I, I like this, but nobody laughs when I put this up. This is a New Yorker style humor, so maybe you don't like it. I always thought it was cool. We're pretty sure it's West Nile virus. So West Nile was first isolated in 1937, not in the Nile, but in the West Nile district, district of Uganda. It's a flavivirus. It was absent from the Western Hemisphere until 1999 when it came to New York City. It probably came in a flight from Israel because the virus that first infected New York is identical to viruses isolated from an Israeli goose on a goose farm. And from New York, it spread throughout the U.S., and now it's all over uh, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Uh, this virus also infects many birds and mosquitoes. And in fact, the bird mosquito is the natural reservoir uh, of this infection. Uh, it's a flavivirus, an envelope virus with an icosahedral core. So you should understand all of that very well. And the virus is maintained in a cycle between mosquitoes and birds. It goes back and forth. Some birds are, are well adapted to the virus. They do not die, uh, and they just provide virus to spread to other birds via the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes like to bite birds when birds are not around. So when it gets dry, the birds go somewhere else because there's no water for them, and so the mosquitoes bite people, and then it gets transmitted to people. So when it came to the US in 1999, uh, it was a very hot summer and um, probably came off the plane on a person and, and a mosquito may have taken it from that person and transmitted to others. Occasionally the mosquitoes will bite people or even horses. These are dead-end infections for the most part. So it really does not go from person to person. Uh, it goes from mosquito to bird to mosquito to person. So if you have a lot of viremic mosquitoes, you will infect a lot of people. So we really don't understand how it came on the plane from Israel, but that's clearly where it came from. So it's transmitted to us by a mosquito bite. The mosquito puts the virus, when it's taking a blood meal, it puts virus into you. Uh, the virus then incubates, replicates uh, for a period of three to 14 days. You get a flu-like illness called West Nile virus fever. But 80% of infections are asymptomatic, so there's no issue with them. The problem is that uh, one in 150 people develop CNS disease. The virus gets into your brain and may cause all of these manifestations, um, many of which are, are long-term. So a lot of people who get West Nile encephalitis have long-term neurological sequelae. So you really do not want to risk getting this in the summer. Make sure you protect yourself against mosquito bites because if it's a West Nile season, uh, you're, you're very likely to get it. So the virus exists in birds, and if it infects exotic birds, so it, there was a big outbreak in the Bronx Zoo in that summer of 1999. A lot of birds were dying, and it turned out that they were getting infected by West Nile, but they weren't adapted to the virus, so they died, you know, all the exotic swans and so forth, whatever else they had there in the zoo. But the crows and the wild birds were pretty much okay. Uh, occasionally we'll bite a, a person, Virus seems to be taken into a dendritic cell in the skin called Langerhans cells. And what do dendritic cells do? They bring the virus to lymph nodes. The virus likes that very much because it has a lot of other lymphocytes that it likes to replicate in. Uh, and then from the lymph node, it will spread by the blood. The spleen is another place where it likes to replicate because lots of lymphocytes there. And as you might suspect, there's an innate immune response to the virus infection. You make TNF-alpha as one of the cytokines, and that loosens up the blood-brain barrier and lets the virus in. I showed you an experiment a while ago where mice that lack toll-like receptor 3 have a lowered invasion of virus into the brain. So TLR3 senses infection, cells make TNF-alpha, it loosens up the blood-brain barrier, and then the virus gets in. And that's why you have this high rate of encephalitis, because the virus is able to get in. Uh, here are the cases of West Nile in the U.S. So remember the first cases in 1999, there were some peak seasons, thousands of cases. This is black bars or total cases. The white bars are meningitis, encephalitis, so that's virus getting into the brain. Um, these peaks tend to coincide with drought in the U.S. because as conditions get dry, as I said, the birds go away and the mosquitoes bite people instead of other birds. And that seems to correlate very well season after season. So this past year in the Midwest, 
There was a big drought, if you remember. Lots of West Nile activity there. This is the case fatality rate. So that is, if you are infected with West Nile, what's the likelihood that you're going to die? And you can see it increases as you get older. So this is a nice example of how older people are more susceptible to more serious disease caused by the virus. So here's the activity for 2012. Again, last summer we had this terrible drought in the Midwest. You can see lots of West Nile clustering in those drought-stricken areas. It basically hits every state, although some uh, more than others. In 2012, there were 5,300 cases total recorded, which is, again, probably under-reporting. 2,700 neuroinvasive, so a lot, a good fraction of neuroinvasion, and 243 deaths. So this is not an insignificant infection. And so many people are working on making vaccines uh, that would be used to prevent this. But at the moment, we don't have any other way of preventing infection except mosquito control. So you know, when you go out on the summer night, you really need to be careful. You have to either cover up exposed skin or use uh, mosquito repellents. Because if you are in areas with a lot of mosquito activity uh, and it's a summer with West Nile around, you can be infected. 